also can I call Bill Cohen Canal. Um, she's a European as well, I think PhD in the Karolinska Institute. And, uh, yes. So now at the Max Planck Institute of Human Development in Berlin. That's correct. You've seen what uh, Steve can do with uh, tens of thousands of scans acquired on three scanners. Uh, we had a slightly different problem, didn't we? We had more than a handful of studies, which were not only different in terms of the scanners, but also protocols of acquisition and uh, other variables. So they, they were particular uh, statistical challenges, and uh, you're one of the authors who've uh, tried to address those. Thank you. Me. Yeah, thank you for the invitation to talk here. Um, I'm very... I'm happy that I'm giving the opportunity to present uh, all the tools that have been developed uh, and are still under development in the life of consortium. And I must say that like a uh, very, very, very small part of this I was really involved in. And most of it is work that has been done by um, the colleagues around Europe or you guys <laughs> sadly sitting here. Um, okay, let me know if I talk too loud now or to... Um, it's okay. <laughs> yes. Um, and this is for clicking further. No? Probably it should be like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, the statistical tools that were developed around, evolved around the challenges of um, large scale multi site longitudinal data. And um, were designed mainly to tackle the, the task of testing for risk and protective factors, um, explaining the individual differences in brain and mental health that we observed in the different cohorts. Um, but we always had in mind that they, they should be used beyond life brain as well. So there is a, um, a number of uh, open source software packages that have been developed, a number of um, theoretical contributions, and also very practical um, hands-on step-by-step tutorials for using different um, approaches that were useful for us, um, but that we didn't develop ourselves. So I give you a short walk through these um, topics and very briefly spotlighting each of them. Starting with um, a meta-analysis tool for generalized additive models. So um, the situation we are oftentimes in is that we have measured change over time. And for example, one brain regions we are interested in, and we use a statistical model to that rep represent that change um, to reduce the complexity to, to test our hypotheses. And for this, we often use parametric models, which are often fine, but um, in really lifespan data from very young age to very old age, they sometimes do not well represent the trajectories. And um, so we get kind of misleading results or we lose information. In this case, we can use GAMS, the generalized additive models, um, which are very flexible with, uh, in terms of functional form of the trajectories. But um, there was no easy way to apply meta-analysis, but we do uh, need meta-analysis oftentimes in life brain and probably in related consortia as well um, because we have like, separate data sets that are not easily um, to lump into one big data set so we cannot use it as one big but we have to um, do the same analysis in the different cohorts and then meta-analysis analyze it. So um, Alison Sorensen and Andreas Brandmeier and Athanasia Movinke in our uh, team have, or in, in the left -hand consortium have developed a uh, method for that uh, and a uh, corresponding R package called Metagam, um, which can do really this meta analysis on GAMs. So um, I'll move on. So if you want to know more for each of them, I'll post a link and you can approach us afterwards. But now I'm moving on to show all the other things as well. Um, so there's another very useful tool for, uh, that also makes statistical modeling more flexible, which was um, developed for LifeBrain. And um, it's especially useful in neuroimaging. If we have many variables that correlate more or less with each other, such as, for example, gray matter probability in different regions of the brain, 
um, we might want to reduce that dimensionality without uh, having strong hypothesis about which of the variables we, uh, would share a lot of variance. So then we turn to exploratory factor analysis, e, uh, EFA. Um, but in the case of the brain, we know that the structures are highly symmet symmetrical. So that uh, one side of the brain, one structure in the left side is very similar to a structure in the right side. And this knowledge we can, uh, in the normal EFA, we cannot um, like feed it into the model. But um, uh, Eric Jan van Kirsten and Rogier Kivit have developed a method to do exploratory factor analysis uh, uh, with adding the assumption of um, symmetry um, and structured residuals in this case. Um, there's also a software package um, that can do this. And I think it will be highly useful in neuroimaging um, data analysis. Spotlight on the next one. Um, Sometimes we are in the situation and you're imagining that we have many variables that are potentially related to an outcome like brain regions or structure in brain regions uh, to uh, cognitive performance. And uh, we don't have strong assumptions regarding which of the brain regions um, are most, most strongly related to the outcome. Um, but we can reasonably assume, reasonably assume that uh, not all of them or like very few, um, a certain like set uh, size of them is related to the outcome. So we have the assumption that a sparse set of predictor variables explains the outcome, but we do not know which of the predictors are going into that set. And in this case, um, it is helpful the, to use a regularization approach, uh, which tries out how much it can cut away or tune down of the weaker relationships in a model. And uh, thereby making it more parsimonious and less prone to overfitting, um, while it still represents the data well. So it's a data-driven way to reduce the model complexity. Um, and this is called uh, also regularized regression if the outcome is only one certain variable. But if you have a latent variable in a structural equation modeling as an outcome, there was no um, such tool. So uh, Ross Jacobucci and Andreas Brandmeier developed um, a tool that can do this regularization in a structural equation modeling framework. So for example, if you have a cognitive performance outcome as a latent variable measured by a couple of uh, different cognitive tests, which is um, generally a good way to, to get a more robust uh, measure of the cognitive ability or even change in that cognitive ability if you have longitudinal data. Okay, Spotlight goes on to the next one, um, which uh, is uh, also maybe a little bit related to the one before because it combines, um, uh, or to the, to the several ones before, it also combines uh, structural equation modeling with a more exploratory approach. Um, uh, for, for the situation, we have a structural equation model that represents how we think about our data as related or how our variables are related to each other. Uh, and we apply the structural equation modeling to our sample. Um, but then we have the idea that maybe this is not a one fits all model, but there are differences or heterogeneities within our sample uh, with regard to how the model parameters um, uh, are optimized. So, for example, if we know that there are probably age differences in uh, how white matter structure in different parts of the brain hang together, um, but we don't know where the optimal cutoff is, or we don't know whether there are like better, it's better to look at three different age groups or five di different age groups or just two of them. Um, we can use um, SEMTRI, which is um, a kind of um, decision tree algorithm that finds out where the best split is to explain the largest difference in the, in the model parameters. So uh, it goes recursively through different kinds of splits and um, then goes with the split that explains the largest difference and then goes on and tests for the next split. And if there's still a difference to explain, it will split the data. So you get groups of people for which the model parameters differ maximally. 
And as an extension, this can be applied to random forests as well, which are, is, are ensembles of uh, many, many trees. Um, with a random aspect of that the data for each of the trees is drawn and also the, the predictors are drawn so that there is some variation between the different trees of the forest and uh, in the end one can derive a measure of which are the most predictive variables in our set of predictor variables. So this century has been around for a while already um, with the first publication from uh, almost 10 years ago, but uh, it has recently developed much further and also have been applied more often um, during the life brain time. It has become much faster to run it, and it's also now possible to focus on certain parameters in the model. So if, it, if you want, want to explain, for example, mean differences, but not the variance, differences in variance, or you want to um, you want to explain uh, differences and changes, uh, so you can um, focus on, on that parameter in the model. So it's, it's a very flexible approach, um, uh, which can be suitable in many situations where you want to explore something, but you also have a certain model you focus on. So Spotlight goes on to the next. Um, uh, about the, there's a larger like part of um, what happened in life brain uh, methods wise uh, evolving around reliability in neuroimaging. I just want to um, spotlight one or two uh, aspects of it um, because I think many neuroscientists, many of us neuroscientists, have asked ourselves how reliable are our measures actually, and this we can basically only know if we measure repeatedly. And uh, then we can only then we can separate the variance into the true score and other sources of variance. Um, for example, if we measure the same thing twice or the same like neural imaging measure twice on two consecutive days, that allows for um, separating the variance into a true score, a day specific score, a session specific score, and the residual error variance like um, depicted in this model. Sorry. Uh, depicted in this model. <clears throat> um, there's the tr true score here that uh, is a combination of all the measures, but what they have in common. And then there are day specific scores because these two were measured on day one and these on day two. So that's what they have in common, day two, day one. And then a session specific score um, that is um, capturing the difference between these two sessions uh, with respect to what's common with these two, two um, sessions. So, and then all, all the rest of the variance is in the error variance. And this gives a framework to formally test um, the reliability of these different aspects. And it's called um, intra-class effectivity composition, uh, abbreviated as ICE and has been developed by Andreas Brandmeier and colleagues and recently applied uh, by Elisabeth Wenger and colleagues um, with uh, testing the reliability of um, um, quantitative multi-parameter maps in um, uh, magnetization transfer imaging. Uh, Sam Parsons has uh, yesterday shown his um, a helpful tool for applying ICE, uh, which which is also uh, implemented in uh, an R package uh, called ICE, and I recommend to check it up, both uh, the, the the general framework and the R package that helps applying it. Speaking of R, as I as a statistical, um, as a statistical software um, and language, um, many of us use R, um, but for a long time there has no been a real, really good um, way to represent to plot the results of uh, um, region-wise or, or ROI analysis. But now there is GGSEC developed by Akhnasia Movinkel in Oslo, um, which, is, which has developed a, a whole universe of GGSEC um, um, 
yeah, applications uh, to to plot uh, ROI based data. So um, with more than twenty different atlases by now and ever increasing graphical options um, to parcelate the brain. Um, yeah, I guess this is also very useful for many neuroscientists working with R. So they have not, now we don't have to export the data to different programs just to plot them. Going on to the next uh, kind of uh, contributions, um, there has been a very uh, successful tutorial that um, Jorge Kivit and Andreas Brandmeier wrote towards, uh, in the beginning of the live frame period already. And it has by now more than 230 citations. So people are really, it's really popular because it explains very um, nicely and step by step how to go about it. if one has more than one neuroimaging measure and wants to um, investigate correlations between changes or how um, level in one variable predicts change in a different variable, for example, between brain and cognition or between brain and any health variable. It's also um, showing very hands-on how to apply uh, freely available open source uh, statistics software to answer these questions. And uh, last but not least, we have a different tutorial, which is also about longitudinal analysis, um, giving advice on how to use joint models um, that model uh, longitudinal data and time to event data in one model. So if we ask ourselves, um, what uh, are the differences in change before something like um, a disease diagnosis or death happens, um, are the differences between these two groups of people with, with these two outcomes uh, in how they change before that event happens. This is extremely useful. And I think it is until now not very well known that this is possible to, to do this in one model. Uh, so this tutorial has been also has been cited quite a bit, but it's not out as long. And it has been done by um, Cezan and um, Paolo in Geneva. So thank you for joining this quick tour. I know it's a bit, bit of a mixed bag and a lot at once, but I hope you remember some of it when once you're in a situation where you could need one of these tools. Uh, and then check up our uh, LifeBrain website, our GitHub, LifeBrain GitHub account, and then you will find what you need, hopefully. Thanks very much, Ova. Yes. We've uh, got time now for questions. Okay. Quite a bit of time, so if I could ask the speakers to come close to the front, maybe you can share the microphone or use this one. Um, if you have questions um, from online, if you raise your hand, I can see you here, so I can uh, give you the words. If there's no question, I, I take, uh, oh, there's one, good. <laughs> yeah, thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, great. Uh, my question was to Steve yeah. about your uh, most brain aging paper, which we all read and enjoyed. Uh, how do you suppose about the quite different uh, or similar methods to longitudinal data that you did with the cross-sectional data in that paper? We have not at all done that. Um, the, the, the amount of data is much smaller. Um, before COVID, I think it was about 3,000. Now it's five or 6,000, including the COVID people, um, which is actually interesting because even if you exclude the patients, um, the 1,000 controls have a very different longitudinal um, uh, interval. So previously it was all very close to two years. Now it's more of a uniform spread from like two to seven. So it's, it's a technical detail, but it actually changes potentially what, what you'll see in longitudinal analysis. Um, but going back to your question, um, the numbers are not high. Longitudinal differencing, like we were saying earlier, is intrinsically noisy. It's basically, it's like you're doubling the noise from the cross-sectional analyses, but you're also potentially losing out in terms of no longer taking advantage of potentially wide sub 
true subject variability in the cross-sectional analysis. So it would, it would certainly be interesting. Um, I, I, I don't know if you would, I, I think what I would do first if I was doing that would be to take the existing cross-sectional modes and just project them onto the longitudinal data to get the longitudinal equivalent change of the same modes. That would probably be a good place to start because the definition of the modes themselves would then not be noisy. Um, but you could, you could do the differencing and then look at modes, variation and differencing, which would be noisier but interesting. Thank you. That's actually a comment on a different part of this. Uh, well, this, we can discuss everything. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so first, thanks for a great treat. I think these three papers were just a pleasure to, to listen to. And I just want, would like to make a plea uh, uh, um, for the last session that Silva talked about that I think is used uh, not often enough. So we are somehow aware of the fact that probably aging depends as much on distance from death as it depends on distance from birth. Uh, or put differently, that aging predicts death. And what these last calls allow us to do, for instance, is to look at the hazard of dying as a function of the rate of change. And I think in all the longitudinal analyses that we do, we are basically dealing with censored data because there are less and less people of the original birth cohort still alive as we move along on the age axis. So that's, that's really a very biased problem that we have there, and we are not capturing it with our methods, whereas the joint models allow you to do that because, as I just said, they make the hazard of dying predicted by the things that we have in the data, such as level and intercept. So it's just a plea for using this more often because we get a more realistic and and faithful uh, uh, picture uh, of the aging in, uh, process if you include death in our models. Responses? Thank you. <laughs> Kyle. Yes, uh, there have been several results showing the interest in longitudinal uh, assessment with longitudinal scans instead of cross-sectional uh, assessments. And I was wondering whether, <laughs> whether you have any data on the minimum distance between two scans so that the, the signal and the, evolu the evaluation of changes is accurate and above noise. For example, like one month is not enough and a minimum of six months is required, two years is better, something like that. So when we were setting up the longitudinal scanning in Biobank, there was um, a very heated disagreement between the brain people and the cardiac people because of this question. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's that they expected cardiac to change more slowly or that they knew that the cardiac imaging measures were so much noisier, but they wanted more like five to six years um, for exactly the reasons you're talking about, just like the, the effective SNR of difference, longitudinal difference measures. I think in brain, it's very much a piece of string and will depend very much on the individual IDPs or vary for different IDPs and different, um, d different aspects of brain structure and function. We went for two years because we thought that was a decent compromise. There's, there's other factors like um, if, this, if this is ever going to be useful as a marker, if it's ever going to be useful as a longitudinal marker, you don't want to have to wait, you know, longer than two years before you can use it um, when you're considering a patient's um, trajectory, um, which I know isn't, isn't your question, but that was another reason why we didn't go for longer. Um, any other? Uh, no, it's, it's not really um, answering your question, but um, we have uh, in, our, in the methods group in, in Berlin mainly, um, uh, people have developed a tool, uh, like a theoretical framework, um, formal framework, but also a tool to um, explore and plan longitudinal studies in a way that um, <coughs> power uh, is optimized. Um, so basically they're like formalizing the trade-off between how many times you have to measure, how long is the time span you have to cover if you expect a certain effect size in the change that you wanna have. So how much data do you need and how many time points and how in which uh, time trajectory 
But of course, you need to come with an idea about how much change uh, you expect. And this is exactly the, your question. I, I would just want to point out that, that, that there's, um, there's like a formal way to plan a study once you have this idea a little bit better, like from, from the evidence that you see in other studies. Like a power calculation, but specifically for yeah, specifically for, for longitudinal and repeated assessment. Any idea whether one modality would be more sensitive and efficient in a short time period than another modality like the compared to T1? It, I mean, it, from my point of view, it's, it depends very much on what effect you're wanting to study, like specific disease or aging. Um, but the the only way to easily answer that question is to just say which which are the lower noise measures and not worry about what the application is. So. You know, the structural volumetrics are uh, some of the lowest noise measures. And also, I think it depends on whether you're interested in, in, in group mean changes or in individual differences, because I think individual differences you probably see, short, uh, like maybe in a shorter time, I mean, it's just guessing, <laughs> but maybe you see that already evolving in a shorter time frame, but longitudinal changes only if your cohort is like not too healthy and well um, over time, and that's the like mean decline ready. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that yeah, essentially what you say that it depends well the measure and the, the sample and you know the yeah. effect that you want to test for brain age. Mm -hmm. I was looking at CBC data because we have acquired uh, in some individuals like T1 data twice, like a double scan in two time points. And for brain age, like around 3.5 years in healthy, relatively old populations is about 0 0.7, a little bit above 0 0.7, the reliability of change. Uh, but yeah, of course, this will depend on the measure. If you look like a specific measure, that probably is going to be lower. If you would look, uh, I don't know, AD, like AD versus um, uh, controls, then it's probably going to be higher. It will depend, but that's oh, just an estimate. Yeah, uh, for comments also yesterday, I uh, suppose that if you have more than two scans, it will do a great deal of removing noise. So let's say we have four scans over a year, it will probably be a quite pure measure, I would guess. Uh, so increasing the number of scans can be a way of shortening the time it is. Yeah, <clears throat> I have the impression when um, when we started LifeBrain like six, seven years ago, so people were saying, well, you know, methods are really important with neuroimaging data because uh, people are not aware of certain aspects and certain things, so they're not necessarily used to that. And uh, I remember having the chance of working with some people that are very good in imaging, where when you submit a paper, they would ask you to take the equations out because they're too complex, or shorten the whole method part or take the figures out. And um, now we've just seen three wonderful uh, talks about methods and method development in, uh, in imaging. And I was asking, I was wondering whether you've seen like it has happened in other fields like psycholinguistics, all of a sudden people start using more complex models because they realize certain things. Do you think that has happened in the imaging literature on a very large scale, on a very broad scale? Do you think that uh, people now in the neuroimaging literature are more open to certain advanced methods or are they still asking uh, some of you to simplify the methods part, take equations out, take the Greek parts out and so forth and only leave the color pictures in? I'm oversimplifying this, obviously. Well, when, when Christian Beckman wrote his first paper on ICA for fMRI um, 20 years ago it was rejected by the, I won't say who, editor at Neuroimage because it was too mathematical and too hard. And it, it's very simple at its core. Um, and turned, he published it elsewhere and it turned out to be a very impactful paper. And I think that's a good example of what, of what you're talking about happening. But mostly I would say we haven't really seen that even over the last 20 years. We've the field has had sophisticated um, analysis methods, particularly image processing, probably more than back-end stats um, throughout that whole period and improving things like you know, multimodal registration. But I think, I don't know if you agree, but I think maybe in terms of 
the very back end statistics, the 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 um, sophistication of that is probably increasing now in a way that hasn't happened so much before. Some of the stuff that you are showing, you know, that's not been used mm -hmm. so much in imaging until fairly recently. Yeah, exactly. I think I think I think uh, that the communication is also getting better between those people who develop these things. They make it more available, more accessible. And, and the, the people using it. And then, I mean, there's also not a the real divide. I feel like uh, even within the consortium now, it doesn't feel like there are the methods people and these are the, the applier, but it's all like a discussion between everyone. And um, I think this has become better. I would say also like the new generations also come with like that come from like a more psychological background and so on. They often have also like better. Oh, yeah. no, I, I, I don't have a huge uh, perspective on, on this on the field, but that close to my. But uh, I, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would say that maybe also like from like a educational background, like uh, also like people that come from a psychological or like a med biomedical degree, they have also like more statistical and uh, background and maybe the they are also like more capable to integrate with with other um yeah with other people from other backgrounds yeah. but i think and you, your paper is a really nice example where there is not pages and pages of complicated maths but what's really cool in the paper is that you asked a different question and you asked the really important question about cross-sectional versus longitudinal and that was really cool but i think that's more important than specific methods and that's great. Any more questions? You have a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so I, I don't, I can't remember if this is already covered in, in your paper or not. Um, but one of the points that you, you were making rightly at the end is that the, the evidence that you showed suggests that a lot of the, um, the, the sort of signal in brain age delta that we see um, is due to um, baseline variability. And I can buy that from the results. That, that's really important. Um, but it must still be the case that the, the prediction of age, the, the brain age that you use to feed into the data, um, where you have good age prediction, which you do in, in these data sets, that must reflect an aging process or it would not be able to predict age. And so there's a bit of a tension there. Presumably what this is saying is that the, the age prediction is, is valid because you are actually using Im imaging data to predict age. You can't kind of take that away. And so that must reflect something that is changing with age. But what you're then seeing and saying is that something similar, something with similar patterns actually probably dominates your final estimate of delta and, in a, uh, and that that domination of that delta is actually about baseline effects, which must therefore mean that kind of spatially or structurally functionally, there is maybe a, a coincidental similarity between those baseline variations that are actually dominating delta and the aging pattern, which we believe because it allows us to predict age. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Also, maybe I'm wrong here, but uh, um, yeah. my also, um, uh, so like we are predicting this kind of, uh, 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 yeah. we, we predict an aging process, but at the end of the day, we are often interested in the individual variability. And, uh, and by optimizing the age prediction, we don't necessarily, I mean, and often in this sense, we are interested in how, you know, in uh, the differences between individuals. And uh, I, so, so I agree with you, but I also don't know that to which point, you know, by optimizing the, the, the age predictor, we don't necessarily are optimizing the differences between individuals in what we most likely want, or some of, some of us would like to want, which is like predicting the different trajectories of aging. And, and in this sense, maybe, I mean, for example, Christos Abadzikos was saying you know, something like, oh, maybe bad models are better. I'm not sure I agree with this, but, uh, 
um, maybe like for example your life paper where you look like some modes have like a like a huge uh, spread with it maybe here we are going to be to have better estimates like cross-sectional estimates of uh like separating like the individual trajectories of of rate of free energy so to say so uh yeah i so yes but the point being like this i am not necessarily agree that 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 by optimizing the, the edge prediction, you get a better uh, estimate of, of uh, yeah, the individual trajectories. But of course, it could be, especially with that, uh, that uh, yeah, some of it, like some the previous structure also reflects the way that the change. That is a possibility. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, uh, and it, it has only just occurred to me that maybe what you could do as a different way of training the original prediction is training it to try and find maximal spread. So, uh, was, yeah. so, so we, 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 we came up with this really simple measure for measuring the spread, but we never thought of going back and trying to maximize that with a particular prediction. And that would be interesting. I was uh, now playing with uh, ventricle as an example, but uh, I think that because yeah, ventricle would be like, uh, like uh, lateral ventricles would be like something that would kind of fit the, this mm -hmm. thing. I think one problem, though, is that, for example, when you look at ventricles, also the variability of ventricles when you look at older age is highly influenced by uh, unwanted factors. Like, like, let's say, if you look intracranial volume, and you assume that people with higher brains don't don't change more, which is well, we can discuss about that. But it explains, for example, in the forty-five to fifty years old, it explains around five percent. But in like eighty years old people, it explains 20% of the variability. So I think like some of this dispersion is also like conditional to some aspects that uh, we most likely want to control. And in this sense, maybe we can, I was thinking that maybe one possibility could be to integrate some of the work that uh, Fidel uh, Alfaro Almagro uh, did like kind of very aggressively denoising some um, noise that we think that it's not going to relate to change and then see what happens with the uh, trajectories and yeah. maybe also we can uh, integrate like this hypothetical trajectories that could be uh, with like measures of ongoing change and maybe this would get us the best predictions also in a little bit what Ullman say in using the last method uh, mm -hmm. kind of do the predictions of change but uh, yeah and just the last thing uh, I think that when you really look at cross-sectional brain age it also can be a very good predictor of like for example, mortality or things that can happen in the future. It doesn't if you're if you want to look at the prediction, it's not necessarily like that measure. If you want to interpret it as change, then it's something that probably we want to discuss. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. That's good. I can't believe it. No questions from Andreas or Lars. There was one thing I, I meant to ask Steve. Andreas actually, yeah, he surfaced, but he's got his microphone switched off. He didn't want to ask any questions. <laughs> Very happy with everything. Right. Yes, one, one thing I need to understand a bit better. This is, you started uh, coming to brain ages via modes. Why did you do that? Um, you know, obviously there are different ways of arriving at the same target and, and uh, understand that you want to, to um, define the variability in some, in some logical way, uh, but obviously it doesn't optimize the age prediction in each case. Um, have you thought about the, the pros and cons? I mean, as, as a clinician, I am particularly interested in the, in the, the age gap, you know, which is not following the normal age trajectory, as it were. What are the advantages, disadvantages? Uh, to you? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the premise was, was quite simple, that we didn't want to assume that there was only one mode of aging and force everything into that one mode and effectively blur the biological differences between the different modes of aging. And we see plenty of evidence for that in the results. 
at the at the cost of doing a less good job overall of predicting brain age and then you get this trade off that when when the prediction is low the brain age gap doesn't mean anything very useful anymore yeah. that so that was the simple premise just not wanting to mush everything together structurally and functionally into one prediction does it make uh, interpretation easier i mean i know people in practice are saying we only look at structural data we only look at functional data we only look at uh, neuropsych data whatever uh, which you can sort of understand because you may only have one or the other available. But uh, does it help interpretation in your mind? Um, I, I think so, though uh, interpretation is not that, in, in terms of which individual measures are driving it, interpretation isn't that hard anyway, because if you, if you do an all-in-one, you can look at the regression yeah. weights. Yeah. You know, assuming that, I mean, one thing we did that gives even better prediction is going back to the voxel level data and using a deep net and we got amazing prediction there, and that's great and valid, but you can't interpret that very easily because it's not linear. But almost all of the methods people use are close to linear and very interpretable in terms of the internal weights. Um, but then, like like my slide on the um, <clears throat> like the, the the postmenopausal rapid change in females, um, we can interpret down to a level of like which which phenotypes are associated, but the biology. Um, just takes a lot more investigation. The, right. the, the true underlying biology is not, not straightforward. Yeah. You don't have a repro reproductive span for those guys, have you? Uh, I think, and, and you're saying, yes, I think, I think we have a lot of that information, actually. I think we do have a lot of that, that information, but, but we have not gone, got, done individual subject analyses um, using that. Um, but that would be a sensible thing to do for, for that mode. Okay, well, thanks very much. If there are no more questions, uh, I think everybody's hanging in the ropes and hear the, the coffee machines humming in the background. So thanks very much to the speakers again.